Well, hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining our trainee editorial board seminar for uh, the Radiology Artificial Intelligence Journal. It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor John Banja of Emory University, uh, who's going to discuss fairness and bias in machine learning. Uh, John is a medical ethicist and is a member of our editorial board. And Dr. Banja, the, the floor is yours. Dr. Khan, thank you. And thank you all for zooming in, tuning in, dialing in, whatever the right verb is for uh, what we're going to be doing over the next uh, hour or so. So Dr. Khan asked me to talk about fairness uh, in machine learning, and I'm going to uh, do that. I'm a medical ethicist, though. I'm not a data scientist. I wouldn't know uh, a line of Python uh, or Java if it struck me right between the eyes. But I want to share with you some of the lessons that I've learned over the last four or five years in which I've been studying the ethics of artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially in the field of, uh, of radiology, because I've got some grant support. And as a matter of fact, I should mention that from the uh, Advanced Radiology Services Foundation in Grand Rapids, Michigan, as well as some uh, uh, grant money from our own Department of Radiology and Imaging Sciences at Emory University. So I'm grateful and beholding uh, to those uh, two entities. So um, just to, to, to get right underway, um, us moral philosophers, when we start talking about justice and fairness, uh, if you want to go back to day one, uh, a lot of us quote Aristotle, and we quote a little passage from Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, where actually Aristotle said that 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 justice uh, or or fairness, justice as fairness, really consists in treating equals as equals. So think about that. So fairness is treating equals as equals. And in this particular quote from AZ Quotes, uh, they kind of interpolated that to get that injustice, the contrary, obviously, results as much from treating unequals equally as from treating equals unequally. So, I, I mean, if you just think about this for a second, this is kind of intuitive. It's a no-brainer. Treating equals is equals, uh, but when folks are unequal, uh, we don't want to treat them uh, equally. So it, it it makes sense, but the problem is, <laughs> as soon as you go to step two, um, it, it, uh, Aristotle's uh, aphorism, his observation, it begs the question as to, well, what are the criteria that you use to determine inequality? Um, because not all inequalities are unfair. For example, I was pre-med a long time ago at Penn State until I met up with vectors in physics. And that ended my pre-med career. Uh, I couldn't figure those buggers out 50 years ago. I still can't figure them out uh, uh, today. Uh, but it wouldn't, the other guys in my class, a lot of them, they didn't have any trouble with vectors, but John Banja did. And so he vectored into, <laughs> no pun intended, vectored into uh, into philosophy, into something that he could understand a bit better. So, but we wouldn't say that John Banch's inability to understand vectors was unjust or unfair because one's talents, especially when it comes to physics, they're pretty randomly distributed. So fairness or unfairness doesn't play into native intelligence, native talents, and things like that. So, you know, that's that's the first problem that we have. You know, wh when is inequality, I wasn't equal to those guys in my class, when does inequality become a justice consideration? And that's really the second bullet. When are inequalities really unfair? When are they undeserved? And that's the difference, by the way, between inequality and inequity. Because when you talk about uh, uh, inequities, you are talking about a difference, an inequality that is not deserved. So if you read that healthcare literature on inequities, invariably the healthcare literature talks about social determinants of health. 
the fact that income variation, education variation, um, a history of sexism and oppression and discrimination against various subgroups, these are undeserved. These are unethical and immoral. The next question, though, that Aristotle doesn't discuss is, all right, you know, given the fact that there are these inequities, and we know that there are, for heaven's sakes, uh, all you have to do is just look at uh, all these kind of morbidity and mortality statistics, and you see that minority groups uh, come out uh, very much handicapped and very, very much uh, uh, having a lessened quality of access to health care, a lessened quality of overall health care to majority populations. So, all right, given that that's a reality in our Western society, well, who bears the burden then for remediating these inequalities and inequities? And by the way, it is a very, very uh, common observation in the social justice literature that there is a large percentage of folks who say, I am not my brother's keeper. Yeah, I, I'll admit that we have these inequities, these inequalities in our society, but don't look to me to remediate them. So who bears the burden for this? And then, you know, what, what measures do you use if, if you admit that somebody's got the responsibility for remediating these inequities or inequalities? Well, uh, well, then what, what measures do you use? So, for example, reparations for our history of discrimination and oppression uh, of Blacks. Uh, how do we decide, number one, whether or not reparations are in order? And number two, what form those reparations are going to take? And I put here this picture of our current Supreme Court, because right now they are contemplating issues with regard to affirmative action, with regard to programs that seek to redress this history of oppression and discrimination that various subpopulations in our country have experienced. Some of you might go back to 1978, or you've read about this Bakke decision, University of California, and I only include this to underline this contemporary um, inclination, especially in our Supreme Court, to uh, dilute the sensibilities of affirmative action uh, as those sensibilities have evolved over 1978. What I'm saying is they have been percolating since 1978. The Bakke case uh, concerned uh, Alan Bakke, who had applied to University of California Medical School at Davis. He had applied twice. He was rejected both times. I think both times he was placed on a wait list. He was ultimately rejected because he was too old. He's 35 years old. And um, uh, Bakke had a, the reason that he was applying at that age is he had served very, very honorably uh, in the war in Vietnam. He, um, in fact, uh, it was during his service, uh, 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 during the Vietnamese, the Vietnam War, uh, that he became interested in medicine. Um, he applied, like I said, twice to the University of California at, at Davis. He was rejected both times. However, uh, some of the executive leadership at the medical school kept encouraging him to apply. He found out, however, and here is the, uh, the the nub of this argument. He found out that the University of California at Davis reserved 16 seats for minority applicants. He found out that his scores, his grade point average, his medical, his MSAT was better, superior to those 16 minority applicants. And he said, you know what? This is reverse discrimination. You're setting aside these 16 seats for minorities discriminates against me. My qualifications are superior to theirs. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. By the way, think about this in the context of algorithms. Think about this in the context of where you are going to add some additional points in that algorithm or that model. This is something cool that we could discuss in the uh, discussion, the Q&A session after my talk. You're going to uh, add some points to this or that subpopulation in order to equalize them 
with the majority population and give them a fair chance, a fair opportunity. This is what Baki was asking for. Uh, I beg your pardon. What Baki was militating against, he said that that's unfair. He said that that discriminates against me and my white population. And again, I bring superior credentials, better credentials to the admissions committee than the minority applicants. Case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court ruled Baki is right. University of California Davis did use a discriminatory mechanism in terms of this strict number of points that they give to minority applicants purely on the basis that they are a minority. And the Supreme Court ordered the University of California at Davis to admit Baki, which they did. He graduated four years later. He eventually went into a residency program in anesthesiology. And I don't know if he's still practicing, but he had a, a solid, good career. I should say in the interest of intellectual integrity that the Supreme Court in 1978 nevertheless upheld affirmative action but only to the extent that the arguments were, we want to admit minorities into our universities in order to diversify the student body and the faculty, for that matter. But the Supreme Court, so, so, so the Supreme Court came down both sides. The Supreme Court said that's okay to admit minorities in order to achieve diversity. It's not okay, though, if you give strict advantaging criteria so as to uh, achieve the goals of some kind of preferential hiring or admission process. It just goes to show you, though, how complicated these fairness issues are. And when we shift the conversation to uh, machine learning, these are all the different kinds of uh, definitions or characterizations of fairness that you get from statistics uh, as they inform our machine learning models and our algorithms. There are all these different kinds of characterizations or uh, definitions, if you will, of what constitutes fairness. I mean, th this is a real, a real mess. And one, uh, as probably a lot of you know, one of the... Uh, uh, facets or dimensions of this that mathematics and statistics cannot uh, achieve is a satisfying multiple characterizations of fairness. I'm going to give you a good example of that in just a couple uh, minutes. So what we're talking about then as we segue into machine learning and in this discussion about fairness is Typically, what we're talking about is we're talking about trying to eradicate bias. Uh, and bias can enter the algorithm at, at any point. It can uh, enter the algorithm as you're uh, collecting the data, as you're curating the data, as you're processing the data, all of these kinds of uh, 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 movements. So what we essentially want to do in order to make a model fair is that we essentially want to equalize the odds or the opportunity of each individual or each subgroup that's going to be affected by the model to secure. We want to make them equal in terms of, of, of their opportunity to secure this social benefit, but whether it's healthcare, whether it's a job, whether it's a mortgage loan, whether it's being granted parole or whatever. And the three most common ways that data scientists try to achieve equality in machine learning is by improving the data set, especially if the data set is faulty uh, and it's not reflective, not representative of all the different subpopulations that are going to be affected by the model. Or they do, and or they do statistical adjustment of the model, and or they do kind of what the Supreme Court would uh, like us to do in terms of deleting a sensitive attribute that can cause uh, bias. So, um, uh, uh, like I say, I'm going to talk. I'm going to give you some examples of all of this. Probably all of you know these examples, though. So I'm 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 not going to tell you anything that you already don't know. But I like this definition of a bias algorithm. What bias means uh, by uh, Ponch and his. Uh, 
uh, co-authors uh, back in 2019, that bias is essentially a waiting, uh, uh, W-E-I-G-H-T, a waiting of an algorithm, a waiting of a, of a, of a model uh, such that the model is prejudiced, such that the model unjustly, and that's the important word, it unjustly favors or discriminates against a certain individual or a certain uh, group. And before I give you some examples of that bias, um, remember, you know, it's, th this is, I think, the great challenge that you guys are up against as you try to create your models. The, 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 the challenge is that it's a whole heck of a lot easier to create a model from data that's readily available. I mean, I, I chuckle when I think if I was trying to create, let's say a breast cancer model at Emory, what would I do? I'd probably make a beeline for the Breast Cancer Imaging Center at Emory, uh, you know, and I would uh, talk to the director there and I would say, I'm trying to do this. And he would look at me and say, yeah, you and a hundred other people at Emory, but here, here you go, here's our data. So in other words, I would go to a data source, a data bank that is readily available. The problem with doing that at Emory, it wouldn't be such a problem because we see a tremendously diverse population of, uh, of patients. But you know, if you're trying to develop a model in East Cupcake, Georgia, and you uh, uh, are from a very well-heeled hospital that most minority folks don't go to because they can't afford it, or conversely, you primarily treat a Medicaid low income population so that you're top heavy with minorities, um, th that data may fail to represent all of the groups that the model is uh, is going to be used on. And, you know, there's also a thing that I don't know that we talk about enough. We talk about it a little bit, but it's the accuracy, too, of the data that you use. And I will tell you, that uh, statisticians and demographers comment on the fact that data is much more likely to be inaccurate if we're talking about minority populations who oftentimes don't access health care uh, all that readily as majority populations do, or they access it on a hit and miss uh, uh, kind of nature. It's just much more lively, uh, again, likely, and you folks, again, know this better than I do, for their data uh, to be inaccurate than it is for a majority population. Um, okay, so like I said, you know, bias can enter this model construction at any stage, and it can be perpetuated uh, by use if we do not do a good auditing of those algorithms. And more and more, and this is especially the case as our algorithms are imported more and more into our healthcare systems, we're going to have to do these audits relentlessly because things are just gonna keep changing every one year, two years, three years, things are gonna change. The technology is gonna change, the demographics, your population is gonna change, the models are gonna change, uh, hopefully for, uh, uh, for the better. So uh, Suresh and Gutag, and I'm going to give you these references. You got a slide here that I believe Dr. Khan is going to, Dr. Khan is going to uh, share with you the PowerPoint, going to post it. So Suresh and Gutag in 2020 listed a bunch of very common uh, biases that occur in algorithmic models, historical measurement, representation, optimization, aggregation. And I'm going to give you some examples of uh, of each one of these, not that I have to. Again, I am uncomfortably aware that you guys are data scientists, and you know, here I am, an ethics guy, uh, like I say, who would know a line of Python if it smacked him right in the kisser. But um, so, uh, perhaps one of the most famous uh, examples of the historical bias is women applying for jobs, IT jobs, at Amazon some years ago, not very long ago, as a matter of fact, maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and Amazon realized that uh, the algorithm that it was using to separate out and distinguish the uh, good job applicants, because the question that was asked to the model was find the best applicant to hire. And the executives at Amazon became aware of the fact that this uh, model was just simply selecting all male applicants and it was uh, rejecting all of the females. Um, and uh, and what was the reason for that? Well, it was because in the history of Amazon, everybody who was applying for an IT job was a man or was a male. 
Uh, and that's all the algorithm knew. The algorithm doesn't know anything about the hist history of bias or discrimination. So the, the algorithm is just to ask to find the best applicant to hire and all the successful hirees in the past were men. That's what the algorithm is going to know. That's what it's, that's what it's going to go on. So the algorithm just routinely rejected all of the female applicants. So the decision was, well, what, we, what we're going to do to correct this bias is we're going to just delete sex from the, uh, the applicant uh, applications. The problem was that the model would still pick up on uh, sexual references in resumes and CV. So if a person indicated in their resume, I was the captain of the women's tennis team, or I went to an all girls college, zip, you're gone, you're out. So uh, you probably know that, that example, but I'll bet you you don't know this one. Richard Lee, who some years ago went to get his passport renewed in New Zealand, and uh, this was the first wave of using AI technologies to identify terrorists. So what happens is a camera would take a picture of your face, and then that picture would be referred to the AI model to make sure that you were a terrorist, and the model refused. Richard's photograph. It refused to renew his passport because it said Richard does not have his eyes open. He's got his eyes closed and the subject's eyes have to be open in order for us to renew the passport. So obviously we had a representative, a sampling bias here that the model was guilty of. The model just simply wasn't normed. It wasn't educated on enough Asian persons. So um, Obermeyer's uh, now famous article published in 2019 in Science, I think it was. And like I say, this is a pretty famous article now. Great example of a measurement bias where this algorithm, which had been used extensively by insurance companies uh, in order to identify insurers, who were at pretty high risk for developing some nasty cardiorespiratory neurological conditions. What the insurance company wanted to do was identify these high-risk folks and get them into a special care program. Um, what Obermeyer found out was that even though there were blacks and whites with identical medical histories, identical symptomatologies, identical measures of their, of their health, the algorithm was much more likely to encourage, or I beg your pardon, to identify white persons who were insured by the company, to identify them and encourage them to get into this special care management program than it was for the black insureds who were in the plan. And so when Obermeyer and his team went in to try to figure out why they found out what the answer was. They found out that the programmers had used healthcare utilization as a proxy for healthcare need. Uh, so that, I mean, healthcare need was obviously the primary objective or goal of this whole uh, program or endeavor, but the programmers were using healthcare utilization and that biased the algorithm because blacks tend to utilize the health system less than whites do for a variety of reasons that uh, black insureds uh, may not have the, uh, the income to access uh, healthcare as much as whites do. They, you know, they, they might even lack some very fundamental things like transportation, like being able to get off from work to, to go to a doctor's office or a clinic for an examination or for a treatment. Consequently, Blacks delay longer than whites to get the kind of health care uh, that they need. So, uh, you know, once uh, uh, Obermeyer and his group corrected uh, for that historical uh, uh, phenomenon, a historical uh, fault, and corrected that label, the two groups were, uh, were, were equalized. The optimization bias. What factor of your or what dimension of your algorithm do you want optimized um, for it to function, quote unquote, well or ethically or adequately? And I'm sure, again, that you all know this one from the uh, the COMPASS study. Um, 
but I'll tell you again, I guess because I'm not a data scientist, this really fascinates me. What Anguin found out in this ProPublica report was she and her team looked at uh, individuals coming up for parole and found that an algorithm that was extensively used uh, by the courts, extensively used to identify persons who were likely to reoffend, because I mean, if you're coming up for parole, and this algorithm says John Vange is very, very likely to reoffend. So he's going to be rearrested and going to be sent back to jail. You obviously want to keep that person uh, in jail. You don't want to put a, re a likely to reoffend person back on the streets. So Anglin found out that as far as the predictive accuracy of this model was concerned, it did not discriminate between whites coming up for parole and back blacks coming up for parole. So to use your language, the true positive rate was pretty equal. It wasn't great, by the way. Uh, this was the true prediction rate for reoffending of blacks and whites. It was about 65% accurate in both groups. So it didn't discriminate on that basis. When they looked closer at the algorithm, though, and they looked at the false positive rate. So the false positive rate is you're likely to reoffend. That's what the model predicts, and it's wrong. That prediction was much more likely to oppress blacks than it was whites. So, and I use the word oppress accurately here, because if you're coming up for parole, obviously you want to get out. Parole is a benefit. But the fact that the model, though, is inaccurate, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a false positive, it's going to keep you in jail. Consequently, that is a profoundly discriminatory move. The false negatives, however, favored whites. The false negative being, you're, the negative being, you're not going to reoffend. It turns out to be false. But that favored whites. That error rate favored whites. So here you go. And, and statisticians have found, have talked about this as the impossibility theorem, where you one element of fairness, namely predictive accuracy for individuals, is it is fair. But another element of fairness, which is the uh, achieving equalized um, uh, false, uh, falsehoods in the groups, that turns out to be uh, these false negative scores and false uh, positive scores, the error rates, that's what I'm searching for. The error rates between the groups um, is, uh, is, is inaccurate. So, and you can't have both. You can't both have predictive accuracy as well as true error rates in the group. So who do you favor? How are you going to optimize the algorithm? And I believe that statisticians and data scientists are still rocking and rolling with that one uh, today. This is something that I'd like to, that I hope comes up in our conversation uh, at the end of my talk, um, because it, it, it fascinates me. Basically, the aggregation bias uh, is a problem of mixing populations and mix them careful, uh, carelessly so that the model doesn't, I, doesn't perform well either on a single uh, a subpopulation or it only performs well on the majority population. And I'm just going to put this out there and, like I say, hope that we discuss it later because it fascinates me. I talk to our data scientists at Emory and I present this problem to them. And I present it in the form of, are you guys looking for a one size fits all algorithm? So like uh, a breast cancer detection model at Emory Hospital. And Emory Hospital sees all kinds of, I mean, a, a tremendously diverse uh, landscape of women coming to Emory. So are you creating a one size fits all algorithm or when a woman comes in who is of let's say Southeast Asian heritage or ancestry, you have a special model for her. When a woman from East Africa comes in, you have a special model for her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how, you know, how do you do that? And I, I, I get different responses from different data scientists. So I don't know what the answer uh, to that is. 
I just simply throw it out there as a problem. But another problem that's really, really interesting, I think, is this problem of intersectionality, especially when it comes to race. Uh, so I talked to data scientists at Emory and they shake their heads at me and they say, you know what, race is becoming a less and less valuable category to use in algorithms. And, and, and the reason is this, suppose, suppose you are one of Tiger Woods' children. Here's the problem. Tiger, Tiger's mom is from Southeast Asian descent. His dad is African-American. And the mother of Tiger Woods' children is a 100% Scandinavian, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, white-skinned, 100%. So if you're Tiger Woods' children and your immediate ancestry is African, Southeast Asian, in Scandinavian, what box do you check when when they ask about race on a college admissions or a job application or or whatever? So I you know I talked to uh, Judy Gachoya, who is from East Africa, uh, really developing an international reputation for herself uh, in AI. She's an interventional radiologist. She went to school in East Africa. And I said, how, how do you guys uh, talk about that? And, and she said, we don't talk about race in East Africa. We, we talk about tribes. What tribes are you, what tribe are you from? Because there's like nine different tribes uh, in Africa. So, uh, I mean, uh, uh, one of the challenges, one of the many, many, many challenges that we have in trying to improve algorithms. But here's the bottom line. And I'll tell you, for an ethicist who's trying to come up with a definition of fairness, here's where it's at. There is no one size fits all remedy to bias. There is no one size fits all definition of fairness. If you delete a protected attribute in the interest of colorblindness, this is what the Supreme Court wants us to do, then as all of you doctors know, you might sacrifice something that's very valuable because oftentimes knowing, for example, the race of the patient can be very, very important in making your diagnosis and coming up with a treatment recommendation. As we saw with the compass algorithm, an, a, a model might not be able to accommodate all the different notions of fairness uh, uh, out there. If you attempt to readjust the algorithmic weights, you might do something that's illegal and that might provoke uh, a lot of consternation from various political factions in this, uh, in this country. A very common recommendation from uh, AI designers is, all right, here's the way we handle fairness and bias. The way we handle it is we get culturally diverse teams, especially people who represent cultures that have historically been discriminated against, and they're going to help us figure out how to come up with this fair algorithm. Fine, great. But the problem is, uh, all right, when do I know that I've got a culturally diverse team? When I've got somebody from Africa, but where in Africa? When I've got somebody from Southeast Asia, blah, 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 blah. You know, and, and what kind of, uh, I, I mean, the, the, this could, can you imagine, this can get bewildering in terms of identifying when you have an adequately diverse team of individuals. And by the way, that adequately diverse team of individuals in no way ensures that they're going to be unbiased. You might have capitalists in that group. You might have socialists in that group. You might have communists in that group. In no way, just because you got people of different skin color and different income, in no way does that guarantee that you're going to have the, phil the philosophical uh, diversity um, that, um, uh, that, 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 that you want. And then, you know, a very common uh, suggestion as far as algorithms, which by the way, I endorse and believe is you got to have them, you got to make them transparent. If you're going to be accountable for a fair algorithm, putting a fair algorithm out there, you got to be willing to open up that database and the code and all that kind of stuff to folks who want to take a look at it and who want to determine whether in fact, uh, the data set and all the other dimensions of that algorithm are quote unquote, fair. 
you know what? We're going to get a lot of pushback on that from the private sector who doesn't want to make, <laughs> doesn't want to open up their algorithm uh, because it's proprietary. And they're going to want to shield uh, that algorithm from that kind of public scrutiny. So uh, what kind of remedies are out there? Um, this is a nice article by Milagros Michelli. came out just last year. Uh, and in this article, she and her team point out that, look, transparency is a moral must. We can't have accountability. Uh, we can't have developers and designers just simply going to users and saying, look, trust us. We're wonderful people. We're ethical people. But we're not going to show you how our algorithm uh, works. So uh, in, a, in a paper that uh, some co-authors and I uh, have just submitted to a, to a journal, we, we are asking the kind of questions or, or we're encouraging that user groups ask the kind of questions that, uh, that need to be asked in order to try to ensure fairness. So they need to be asking questions about why did you use this particular uh, data set and when you have trade-offs, like in the compass algorithm, trade-offs between predictive accuracy and equalized error rates, I mean, how do you how do you negotiate those? How do you how do you navigate those? Regulation, uh, the private sector does not want regulation to happen. Although I believe just last week Microsoft came out, Microsoft came out and said that regulation is going to be absolutely necessary as we proceed with the future. Of, uh, of these models. So, you know, uh, suppose a regulation came out that required a developer to disclose the data set uh, as, as to its representativeness, as to its integrity. I wonder how the commercial sector, the private sector would uh, uh, would take that to, to that. And how does my model affect minority populations? I think we're gonna need professional organizations to uh, get behind guideline development for data management. We're especially going to have to educate the lay public, which I think is going to be an enormous job, uh, as to how their data is going to be used. You know, when I go into the hospital for care, I'm being you know, presented with dozens of pages that I have to sign off on, informed consent pages, and there's a stipulation somewhere in the density of all those pages that says, I consent to allow Emory Hospital to use my data for research purposes. And once I sign off on that, Emory can de-identify my data and then use it however they want. Well, there are a lot of ethically minded people who think that's not a good idea at all. John Banji should know how that how Emory is planning to use that data because, you know, Emory might be using that data for purposes that John Banja does not approve of. Uh, if John Banja is opposed to abortion, well, this wouldn't uh, uh, happen to me, but if I was Mrs. Banja, uh, if, if Mrs. Banja is opposed to abortion, she might not want to have her data used for abortion uh, research. Um, I might not want my data to be used for identifying persons with uh, depression or bipolar uh, disorder, especially if we're talking about facial recognition uh, technologies. I might not want, want my data to be used for weaponry uh, research. So, you know, I think we're gonna see this. And by the way, in uh, the GDPR in Europe, the general data protections regulations in Europe are much more specific and they're much, much more autonomy minded for patients. You've got to stipulate how that data uh, is going to, uh, to be used. And then I think we're going to need to have a lifetime audit, moral audit of these, uh, of these technologies. Uh, and we're going to uh, audit them for inaccuracies. Like I said earlier, minority uh, medical data are a lot more inaccurate than majority. Technology is going to change, right? Imaging technology is going to change. When you change the cameras, you change the images, you're going to have to change the algorithm. You're going to have to change the database. And then demographic changes. 
uh, you know, where a, a hospital that, let's say, one time treated largely a majority population, a white population, now sees a tremendous influx of minorities. That's going to have to change the uh, the models and the data training sets uh, that that hospital uh, uses. And then, you know, to monitor the risks to users, the transparency, the generalizability. And like I say, that lay public experience, and that's going to be a huge one. Uh, that is going to be uh, really uh, uh, a challenge for uh, my children and my grandchildren to uh, to deal with. Well, uh, I've got about six or seven uh, threats as we gaze into the crystal ball here about um, what AI presents. And I, I think I'll take about five minutes and tell you what I think your generation is going to have to do. I'm, I'm retiring next year. So uh, you're going to have to rock and roll with uh, with these uh, phenomena. I might give us something to talk about too in our Q&A session. Um, so the forecasters, the crystal ball gazers, uh, think about the uh, importing of these uh, machine learning technologies into healthcare. And one of the things that they're worried about is the de-skilling threat. I've been listening to attending docs attending professors at Emory for the last 20 years uh, complain about how their residents don't know how to do a history and physical. The residents are very, very good at uh, ordering tests, but they're awful uh, at doing a history and physical. And why? Because they're not taught how to, how to do it because they don't have to do it. I mean, if an echo is much, much better, uh, gives us much more accurate results than me listening to a patient's heart, order the echo, right? This is what you're looking at here is a um, automobile plant, a Toyota plant in Japan. And the automobiles here are built from beginning to end by robots. There aren't very many people who staff this factory and uh, what their jobs are is not with regard to the cars, it's with regard to servicing the, uh, the robots. So, you know, uh, this will be interesting. We're gonna probably see a lot of clinical skills that the older generation revered as skills befitting the nobility uh, of a doctor, the integrity of a doctor, the integrity skill set um, going by the wayside. They're going to be replaced with uh, with machines. Legal liability issues are going to be very interesting. Um, you've probably heard about that uh, new technology for diagnosing diabetic retinopathy for primary care providers. So what it is, is uh, I have diabetes. I go to see my primary care provider and uh, she has one of these uh, machine learning uh, models in her office. It's basically a camera that's attached to computer software. Camera takes a picture of my retina and then refers it to the model. And the model decides whether or not my retina looks okay or whether I should be referred to an ophthalmologist. Now I'm telling you this because the model manufacturers, I think it's a company called IDX, have assumed full legal responsibility if their model makes a mistake. So if the model, it's like a false negative, the model says, John, you're fine, no retinopathy there, it turns out that it's wrong. And then I experience all kinds of harms because my, retin my retinopathy was not discovered in time and I sue. IDX is going to shoulder the costs of that of that litigation. So uh, the the interesting issue, the challenging issue, interesting for me, rough for you guys, uh, is what happens uh, when AI becomes a standard of care? What happens when that model says da 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 do this do this and you disagree with it? Do you realize if there's a bad outcome, you could be sued. If you agree with the model or disagree with the model, if you agree, uh, let, so let's say you, I'm saying you disagree with the model, but ultimately you, die, you decide I'm going to go along with it. You go along with it and there's a bad outcome. You're sued. Why? Because the plaintiffs say, for heaven's sakes, you didn't trust your judgment. That was outrageous. We're suing you. You disagree with the model and you go with your disagreement. You override the model and there's a bad outcome. Guess what? You're going to get sued. And they're going to say, obviously, that model knew more than you did. It's the standard of care. You should have followed the model. So you're screwed either way. So we're going to you know, have to figure these things out. And we're going to have to figure out how we're going to apportion 
legal liability in this case? Is it the hardware designer? Is it the software designer? Is it Dr. Schmo? Uh, is it Emory Hospital who should have maintained, who should have up kept uh, these models? Uh, so the legal scholars are writing their articles and scratching their heads right now. You know, think about how uh, uh, the stethoscope in the early 1800s replaced the physician who, in order to listen to the patient's heart, uh, again, I'm talking about very early 1800s. I think stethoscopes came out in 18, 1816, I think. But that stethoscope placed a piece of technology between the doctor's ear and the patient's chest because before the stethoscope, that doctor would have to place his or her ear, well, his ear, right up against the chest of that patient to listen to the heart sounds. Stethoscope did it much better. And most of the physicians back in the early 1800s were happy to use that testicle, but some weren't. You know, some of them said, this, uh, this replaces me. Uh, this dis, I beg your pardon, this displaces me from that kind of physical intimacy with the patient. And I think, you know, we're just going to be seeing more and more of that as AI comes uh, aboard. I wonder if AI would have, uh, would have, prevented the Charlene Murphy tragedy. So on the right is Redonda Bott. Redonda was the Vanderbilt nurse who was convicted on four counts of negligent homicide. Uh, and if you read the story, it's pretty, it's pretty chilling what Redonda did, even though I think she was a good nurse, she was a veteran nurse, but she goes to a medication dispenser, she types in VE for Versed, medication dispenser, the first thing you thought was vecuronium. That's what it wants to give her. Uh, I beg your pardon, it didn't want to give her vecuronium. It kept, uh, the alarms kept going off. Redondavat kept overriding those alarms. She eventually did give the vecuronium to Charlene Murphy. And there are all kinds of things that make you scratch your head like, okay, she overrode the alarms. That's very, very common. Uh, but on the other hand, didn't she know when she got the vecuronium that Versed is typically in a liquid form? Vecuronium, she had to reconstitute it with saline. She never looks at the label. She uh, 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 doesn't stay at the bedside of Charlene Murphy when she administers the medication. So, I mean, lots and lots of things. I don't know. Would, would AI have corrected this problem or would it not? Um, Clinical education of the future, how about it? Our medical students know more about AI than our attending physicians do. So we're gonna have a real learning curve. And uh, when we start implementing these technologies, that implementation process ain't gonna be smooth. The learning curve is gonna be fraught. Bringing that meta the, these technologies onto your unit is gonna take weeks and months. Uh, tech teams, you know, today when something goes down with your uh, computer system, you put a, a, an order in and some guy from tech comes over the next day. I don't think that that's going to occur at all. Those people are going to become fixtures on our units. They're going to be, you know, they're your entire 12 hour shift helping the, uh, the healthcare providers. Um, in the early going, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. So um, when I was 13 years old, Ben Casey was, I think, I thought the hottest guy on, on TV. Uh, so Vincent Edwards played this neurosurgeon who was very, very compassionate and wonderful uh, with his patients. He was a friggin' holy terror with uh, uh, residents and with uh, the nursing staff. I mean, he, he would ridicule, screen. He was your stereotypical scalpel-throwing surgeon. Uh, I thought he was just so cool. This is 1961, though. Today, I think if you had a Ben Casey on your unit, you might get away with it at the university, I beg your pardon, at East Cupcake Hospital. You wouldn't get away with it at Ben Casey. You wouldn't get away with it at Penn or at Emory. I mean, somebody would take him aside, say, what the hell is wrong with you? You need to go to charm school. Uh, but I'll tell you what I've seen, you know, in the 40 years uh, that I have been in healthcare environments doing ethics, I, I've seen a tremendous change. You know, I've seen uh, uh, where patients did not have much decision-making rights prior to the Karen Quinlan case in 1976. Um, and, and now, of course, 
uh, we honor their rights, especially at end of life, practicing honesty with patients. Back in Ben Casey's day in 1961, you didn't tell patients that they had cancer uh, because you thought it was too horrible. Protecting confidentiality, that was an afterthought in the, in the 1960s. Disclosing errors. When I started to learn about er uh, error disclosure and write about it in 2000, 20 years ago, you didn't disclose errors to patients. They were mostly concealed. So I've seen all of these things happen you know, in my career. Uh, and I just want to say to you that ethics falls, uh, follows the footprints of technology. That's why I have a job. Ethicists have a job because of ICUs. Uh, and the fact that we are importing these new AI, or we're probably going to be uh, in the next five to 10 years, um, you know, the, these technologies will only present us with more and more and, and doubtlessly unprecedented uh, ethical problems uh, than we have seen in, uh, in the past. So I will end with that. Thank you very, very much for your attention. And uh, Chuck, I will turn it back over to you. And uh, let's go. Take it away. Yeah, no, thank you so much for a really elegant presentation. Wow. I'd, I'd love to open it up to uh, to questions here uh, from the group. And indeed, the esteemed Dr. Gachoya has uh, is, has joined. Yeah, us. my As buddy. As you probably Judy. know, Judy is on our editorial board and, and uh, in fact, is our uh, faculty mentor for this uh, this group of trainees. I guess I would, my question to you, if I might, would be as journal editors, we, I think we, you know, as scientists and, and many of us are, are, you know, many of us who are here are doing AI development and are, are actively involved in this, but particularly uh, for us in our role here as journal editors, what could we do to, uh, to help boost transparency and, and, uh, and, yeah. and equity? What what are what are particular things that that you would advise us? Yeah, well, first of all, I was an editor of a relatively, although it was a niche journal, it was American Journal of Bioethics and Neuroscience. Well, a somewhat niche journal. Uh, nevertheless, it had a wide readership. I think that the year I retired a couple of years ago, it had like twenty seven thousand downloads of articles. So I'm not unfamiliar with what comes across your desk. Uh, and, and I've thought about this. You know, I, I want to say that, more, first of all, one of the challenges that every journal experiences is the challenge of trust, because you got to trust these people who are sending their articles into you to be honest, uh, that, that, that they have vetted that data as best as it could be. Because if you got a bad apple uh, out there, and unfortunately, they do occur. You're probably going to find out about this after the fact, after that article is published, after that person, uh, his or her uh, uh, research misconduct ways have been uh, have been discovered. So I don't really know that there's a whole heck of a lot that you could do in order to prevent that article. That, ha that may be plagiarized, that may have data that's been falsified or fabricated. I don't really know that there's a whole heck of a lot that you could do to stop that. Um, but uh, other than intentionality. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, but I, I, th I think that's a really important important point. I mean, we all have to, to trust that people are submitting work, that it's original, that it's hasn't, you know, that it's not, it's nonfiction that yeah. uh right yeah are, are there things i mean you know we do some things to check we do plagiarism checking we do um right. you know i i suspect a lot of journals are going to be uh installing uh zero gpt or similar <laughs> right to, or, or, to make or, sure or that... you give the gpt uh, an authorship credit right that's going to be it that's going to be an interesting one yeah we uh, that one... that gpt is not uh we will not be putting gpt on our editorial right. board right um, largely because but, the, uh, but the are software. there are, are there things that we you know concrete steps that we can take to help promote these ideals yeah so so one of the things that i came across is that you can require uh the authors of your article to make their code uh transparent to uh make their databases open access to explain how they validated their algorithms, 
so what was the external validation that they did on their on their models? You can, you know, so you can kind of, uh, you know, push their challenge, their integrity and make sure that they that they did everything according to Hoyle. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, ultimately, and this has always been the case in science, when I pick up an article from uh, radiology, artificial intelligence, and I'm reading that article, I am trusting that the data reported in that article is true or that it has at least been uh, adjudicated and vetted uh, in a in a reasonably good way. Um, and, you know, that's what we so that when you find out, uh, God forbid, that some article has, in fact, uh, 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 been submitted with corrupt or tainted uh, data, uh, you, you do the right thing. You announce that you're transparent uh, and uh, that article is retracted. Um, Great. Thank you. Are there are there any uh, let me see if there are any questions from our our group here. Okay. Uh, I want I want to ask the group question. Sure, please. Uh, I want, uh, so it seems to me that despite all of the hyperbole and hoopla about these models that we have been reading for the last few years, and every friggin' week I'm reading about some detection technology that is way, way better than all of the board certified radiologists at Emory or the University of Pennsylvania can do. Still, the, the uptake, the, the importing of these models in hospitals has been relatively slow. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, we're still in a kind of a wait and see type of uh, mode right now. I will say just, John, I'll, I'll say for us, it's a combination of things. It's um, often the models themselves may do one part of our task. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that you can replace the entire radiologist with it. Right, and, of course. You know, so something that finds pneumothorax, great idea, but that's not the same as replacing a chest radiologist. Now, on the other hand, these ones that will that can classify normal chest radiographs and say, okay, yeah. we're going to clear those out of your work list. Yeah, that's a possibility, and that you know, at a place like mine and like yours, that constitutes about one to two percent of the chest radiographs that we. I mean, it's not wow. thirty percent. It's a ton, you know. Yeah, so, but if you're doing screening mammograms, though, then it might very well be thirty percent, right? Correct. Yeah. By the way, that's something that I that I worry about for you physicians. So the algorithm comes along in a couple of years and it says, if we're doing just screening mammograms, Dr. Khan, I can tell you that out of these hundred mammograms, these 30 here, you don't even have to look at. They're so clean. They're, I'm 99.99999% confident. You don't have to look at these. So what does Dr. Khan do? He just signs off on them because the algorithm is, is just so good now. Um, here's what I worry about. So that saved you a lot of time, those 30, you know, 30%. Um, it, it, is executive leadership going to say, ooh, that means, Dr. Khan, that you could see a couple more patients uh, uh, with this time that's, that's, that's saved? Versus, does that give Dr. Khan a couple more minutes to spend with each of his patients, which is why he went into medicine to become a, uh, a doctor, right? I mean, I, I, I really wonder because, I mean, one of the things that AI is being touted for is that 30% time that you spend doing documentation every day, you and nurses, 30% of the doctor and nurse time is apparently spent doing documentation. Well, maybe AI could relieve you of a heck of a lot of that, which would be fabulous. But does that then mean that you're just going to be seeing doing more studies and seeing more patients? I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I think the I'm, answer is is going to to that one is going to be yes, John. It's, yeah, the pressures yeah. are are there, and we know yeah. going to be we won't have enough physicians. Um, yeah, in many measures. Well, I I want to just take the occasion to thank you so much for a really stimulating and and uh, 
an interesting presentation. It's great to to see you and thank you for for joining us. We've got, as I as I mentioned, we have this incredible group of our uh, trainee editors here. They uh, they contribute in so many different ways to the to the journal, and and uh, we learn from them and and uh, hope they can learn a little bit from us too. So. John, my, thank my you pleasure. so much for for uh, for joining us. Uh, my really pleasure. Appreciate and it. Thank you all for what you do. <laughs>